is uh, one of your, if this is like your first Sunday, um, or maybe you've been coming for a couple of weeks, and you're asking yourself, what's the deal with the staged dismissal of kids? Uh, we highly value your kids being able to watch you worship with other adults here at Middleton Grace. And as long as we are able, we want to provide that opportunity for them to be able to, uh, to worship with you. Um, and we do it in staged dismissals because we know the littles sometimes struggle for extended periods of time of worship. And so, but we really do think that like at third grade and up, uh, they should be able to hang out for, at least for a little bit. And that last song that we sang, as you guys um, uh, turn into your Bibles, or if you didn't bring a Bible um, and you want to follow along, the, the scriptures will be on the screen. And we're going to be in Exodus 3. We're just going to be looking at four verses today, 13 through 17. There'll be some other things that we look at, but we're not going to get there yet. But uh, you can pull this off, Lethe. We're not there yet. But that last song that we sang, in, in case you were wondering, the title of that song is called Holy Ground. Um, you should look it up. If you uh, do Spotify, uh, Heather releases a playlist every month. It's on the playlist. But I'll just tell you right now, like, that's going to be the anthem of my life for this week. I, I don't know about you, but, like, uh, I got some chains that I need falling. Um, and, and I know that God's the one that can do it. And so um, the, the enemy loves to attack, uh, especially when we think things are going well. And so I, I know that I'm going to make that the anthem of my, my heart, the battle cry of my week this week um but yeah let's let's just dive right in uh yeah, exodus chapter 3 starting in verse 13 we're going to read all four verses uh and then we're going to go back and break them down um uh, in order as we get there and so then moses said to god if i come to the people of israel and say to them the god of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me what is his name what shall i say to them Verse 14, God said to Moses, and it's that famous, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Then go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me, saying, I have, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of, the, of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pezzarites, the Hevitites, and the Jesuits, to a land flowing with milk and honey. And so we approach the word of Lord with awe and reverence this morning as we would see what he would have for us. If you were here last week, you'll remember that one of the things that we talked about was this idea of wilderness where Moses finds himself as he approaches the burning bush, the, the wilderness, this, this place of retreat, this, this place of rest, this place where we connect and commune with the creator who knows us and desires the best thing for us. Moses in the wilderness just made it his life. We see in verse 13 of Exodus chapter 3, he's just working away. He's toiling at the job that God has given him. And it's significant to note that God called Moses while he was busy. Now, if you do anything with the sermon guide, so like you've got this thing, right? we've got like three blanks. We joked about trying to guess if, you could figure out what I was going to say before I said it. Savannah said she got all of them last week. Need to make it a little bit harder. She's already got her answers filled in. But the back of the sermon guide, there are study questions for you for during the week. And one of the, th the questions on the sermon guide last week talked about this idea of busyness. And we talked about that, that God's going to lead you to a place where you have to listen to him. And one of the biggest obstacles to that is busyness. And so before we go any deeper, I just want to make sure that, that, I, that we talk about briefly the difference between being busy and working like Moses was in busyness. And if you're unsure what busyness is, I'm just going to give you an easy definition. Busyness is action without purpose. It's not in your sermon, you can write that down. Busyness is action without purpose. You're just, you're just going around just filling your day with stuff with really no purpose. It's significant to note that God calls Moses while he is busy. He's doing the work that God called him. And if you look all throughout Scripture, 
you will find that God calls people to do things in the midst of the work that he's already called them to do. Rarely does he call somebody that's just sitting on the side of the road. I think of Zacchaeus, a wee little man up in the tree. He's doing something. He's trying to see the Savior. Gideon was threshing uh, a grain in, in Judges chapter 6. Samuel was serving in the tabernacle. David was caring for his father's sheep. Uh, uh, Elisha was plowing. Four of the called apostles were managing their fishing business. For those of you that own businesses, this may not be the end for you. God may just be preparing you for something bigger and deeper than you could ever imagine. And we don't have to sit idly and wait for that call. We work at what he's calling us to do. Matthew was collecting taxes. Now, this isn't a point in your sermon, guy, but it's worth, I think, at least writing down. And it's this, God don't like lazy. I know for all my English teachers, that's improper English, but I said it that way so it would stick in your mind. He does not like laziness. And listen, you're not a special circumstance. Get a job, find a place to serve, plug into community somewhere. I, I, man, I know there are always exceptions. There, the, you, For whatever reason, you can't work or you can't serve, something has happened. Maybe for some of you, you've spent your lifetime working and you've entered into that, that joy of peaceful rest called retirement. Lord Jesus, get me to that day. Woo. All the retirees are like, yeah. There, there's another form of rest, empty nesters. Lord Jesus, I love my girls, but get me to that day. I'm graduating too this year. I got six, six more years. I'm just counting down the days. Becky's like, what are you talking about? Stop. Here's the thing. When we talk about being lazy, I, I, this is a, laziness is nothing more than self-worship. You have all been gifted and designed with a unique set of abilities that God has placed in your heart and in your life to be able to do things. And when you set aside those things to just be lazy and not do them, you're worshiping yourself rather than the creator because what you're saying is what I want in this moment is more important than what God wants for me. The Bible is rife with communication about laziness. God talks about it a lot in the Proverbs. The world will offer quick fixes for laziness, but the Bible provides deeper, more meaningful approach to this idea of understanding and overcoming it. In speaking of laziness and idleness, God in Proverbs 18, 9 says this, He who is slothful in his work is a brother to who is the great destroyer. Now let me say that again. He who is slothful, that's lazy, it's a, it's a fancy old English word for lazy, in his work, whether that be the job that you get a paycheck for or what God's calling you to do in his kingdom, is a brother to whom is called the great destroyer. Who does the Bible identify as the great destroyer? Who? In Proverbs, the lazy man or woman or high schooler or child is identified as a brother with the great destroyer. See, it's not just this idea of physical inactivity. It's a spiritual metaphor. Laziness lures us into complacency. Uh, complacency. It distracts us from our God-given calling, our God-given calling and purpose. Scripture addresses this consistently. It always advocates for a life of diligent stewardship and an active faith. Romans 12, 11 warns us not to be lagging in diligence but in fervent spirit to serve the Lord. That's Romans 12, 11, if you want to write that down. There are all types of laziness. Okay? There's like the lack of work laziness. There's the lack of self-discipline. Unless I just air everything out publicly, I'm just going to go on ahead and do it because I'm talking about me, not my family. If you've been around Middleton Grace at all for the last two years, me standing here today in front of you is evidence of my lack of self-discipline when it comes to food. I lost a whole bunch of weight. 
and I like to say, oh, the stress of spinning off in a standalone church and making all the decisions has put the weight back on. That's a lie. I lack self-discipline. So if I don't have discipline, I have no discipline. I can't say yes to a half a donut. I don't stop. I just keep eating donuts. I don't stop at one plate of, of baked beans and, and, and brisket. I get two plates of baked beans and brisket. And so, <laughs> amen. So it's like, come on, preacher, let's go. And that lack, lack of self-discipline starts at the beginning. Like, I have the tools and the skills to walk into any given situation and say, I'm only going to do this. But I know in my mind... If I do that, then I'm then then because it, and especially if I publicize it to my family, then I'm going to stick to it because they're going to hold me accountable. And I love food so much, I just don't make the decision before I go. And so, standing before you is evidence of my laziness when it comes to self-discipline in food. There's another form of laziness. It's a lack of desire. It's a it's a, a lack of desire. To, in spiritual discipline, to, to notice God, to, to see him in every aspect of our life and where he's taking us and how he's guiding us and how he's leading us and what he would call us to be and do. Do you notice a theme here? Lack, lack, lack. It's all about a choice. Choose not to be lazy. Now that I've gotten all that out of the way, that was just extra. That has nothing to do with the sermon today. I was like, take a deep breath. Here you go. First point. It's okay if you have questions. We, we, I think this was a point back in the Abraham series. And at the risk of like repeating it, like I think there's a reason that God continues to bring these things up. Because I think even if you've been sitting in here for two or three years or if you've gone to church your entire life, uh, the odds are that you're sitting there and you still have a question. You still aren't sure about something. It reminds me of Savannah growing up and her fascination with our family tree. Anybody else have a kid that's fascinated with your family tree? She could tell you right now today, everybody in our family, their birthday, how they're related to us, where it's a second cousin twice removed, is that a thing? Sure. She could tell, I can't even tell you, I can barely tell you my birthday or how old I am. She knows everything about everybody in our family, and she gets really frustrated when it comes to my side of the family because we only know so much so far back. And then it stops with my dad because my dad and his brother were adopted, and we don't know anything about his birth parents. And so there's this lack of understanding which really bothers her a little bit. I just kind of come to terms with them. I'm like, it's not a big deal to me, but, but she, it, she really struggles with it. It, it. And the reason why is because part of that is her identity. It's, it's where she came from. And, and Moses is doing the same thing here in verse 13 when he says to God, uh, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I tell them? Moses is basically... It, it, asking like who are you and what authority are you sending me on now granted i i want to be careful that we don't read into scripture too much but i i kind of place my mind in the mind of moses and i gotta imagine there's a ton of questions running through his head right now he's been gone for 40 years man i gotta think in in his mind he's going are my mom and dad still alive what about my brother and my sister any people that i've known um, what do I tell them if they start to laugh at me? Like, I'm just going to show up out of the desert, some random sheep herder, and I'm going to say, hey, God appeared to me. And he said, pack your stuff because we're getting out. I mean, they're probably going to laugh at him. I, I, I would laugh at him. I'd be like, you and what army, dude? We're slaves, bro. What are you, what are you going to do to Pharaoh and the chariots and the soldiers? You, you're not going to be able to do anything against this. I can imagine he's thinking to himself, am I still a wanted man? He, he fled uh, being chased. He's a wanted murderer in the land of Egypt. And his question gives insight into what's going on to his mind. What's your name? What am I going to tell them? 
Remember, names describe people in the Old Testament, either attributes or successes or simply where they're from or to whom they belong. Your name in the Old Testament has value. I imagine that Moses is expecting God to say something like, I'm the God of your fathers who created the heaven and the earth, who did this and who did that, and begin to list out all the creatures that he created and the stars that he flung into the sky and the, the, the seas that he scooped out with his hand. Moses is expecting a, a litany of information that he can take back to the children of Israel and the people that lead Egypt so he can show, look at the guy that's behind me, and God's answer simply is, I am that I am. I am the one that was. I am the one that causes. See, Moses had questions, but God had answers. Because God always has answers to your questions. Moses asks him, what's his name? And so he gives him the simple answer of, I am who I am. That name, I, I don't know if you wanted to, I should have put a spot for you to write that down. But, but that name, it, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, um, a title for it. it, it, it it's called a, a tetragrammaton. That's a big fancy word. You don't have to worry about that. But to understand the power and the weight of this name that God gives him, I am that I am, you, one of the easiest ways to do that is to compare it to that, that answer to the Egyptian pantheon that Moses is going to go face. The Israelite nation, right? Remember, they're slaves. They, they're living surrounded by temples dedicated to these deities with faces and bodies and birth stories and in some cases even death stories. But most significantly, the names that they had gave them dominion over certain aspects of life in the Egyptian religion. For example, the Egyptian goddess Isis. She had dominion over women and children and medicine. Her name identified her with specific characteristics, and she, swelled, she held sway only over that narrowly defined section of life. She wasn't all-powerful, all-knowing in their, in their faith basis in that religion. She could only influence that specific area. And prior to this moment with Moses, the, 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 the Israelite people referred to God as El Elohim or El, or, or the, like the personal name El Shaddai, which translates to God Almighty. But when God gives his name to his people, it conveys his dominion over everything, the source of his power, his eternal nature. The I am says that he is self-sufficient, self-sustaining God who was and is and who will become and always be. He is never changing. The eternal nature conveyed better in Hebrew than English. The first time that God says, I am who I am in the Hebrew is El Asha Elah, which translates, I will be what I will be. He is stating simply and succinctly that there was none before him and there will be none after him. He is who he is. And so when Moses says, what name do I tell the people? God simply says to them, you tell them that I am. And in those two words, he conveyed a litany of meaning to the Israelite people and to the Egyptian people and on down the centuries to you and I. You can look at it in one of two ways. That I am says I will be, or also it means I will cause. God is the one. God tells Moses in verse 14, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent you. That word is Yahweh. It is the third person version of Eya, which is the first person of Yah which is the first person version of Yahweh. It is translated I am. And what's beautiful about the way that the Hebrew people wrote Yahweh, we've added the vowels later, right? right to, because we speak English and we think we know best. And, and so we spell Yahweh Y-A-H-W-E-H. In, in the original Hebrew, they take out the vowels. There are no vowels. And when you say Yahweh without the vowels, and this is a beautiful thing, and I, I, I've said this before, 
but there's enough new people that you haven't heard it, and so you're going to be like, whoa, that guy's really cool. He came out, that's amazing. When you say Yahweh without the vowels in the original Hebrew, it just sounds like your breath. Yeah. So the name of God is on every lip from the very first moment of its first breath at birth to the very last breath you take. Every time you breathe in, every time you breathe out, you are speaking the name of God Almighty, saying, Yahweh, I am. How beautiful is that? Dude, that is just the most, that, that is unbelievable in its power and its depth and its breadth. That the God of the universe, his name is spoken every time we take a breath. So if you have ant questions, God has answers. And then finally, in the midst of your questions, God has a plan. Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So first he goes and tells the people he's got a plan. He's not just giving them commands. Watch, he's got a plan. And we're going to see more of it next week as we begin to look as, as Moses continue, starts to argue with God about whether he's really the guy or not. Uh, the, the audacity, I say the audacity of Moses to argue with God, but then we sit and do the same things when we know God's asking us to do something. He, he's got a plan for Moses. He says, go tell the people, remind them, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, they're going to connect with that. They're going to understand that because names mean something. They're the sons of Abraham. They're the sons of Isaac. They're the sons of Jacob. Go tell them this is my name forever. And then he says, hey, then go gather the elders, the people that are in charge. Go gather them together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers. And he repeats himself, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He appeared to me in the desert saying, I have observed you. And so, so he says, gather the elders and tell them, I see what's happening. I'm aware of what's going on. I see them. I observe the affliction that's taking place upon them right now. I know what they're going through. And I'm sending you to lead them out because I'm going to show the people of Israel, the people of Egypt, that I am. You know, it's one thing to have an answer to a question. It's another thing entirely to have a plan. God could have just said, I am, that I am. Go tell, just That's it. But it's another thing entirely to show a plan. It's like me in grocery lists. I do most of the grocery shopping. And there are times where um, I do really good, and I'll go get everything that we need. And then there are times where I go, and I get like 12% of what we need, and like 95% of the stuff that I'm hungry for while I'm grocery shopping. Those times that, that, that I get everything that, we need, that I need, you know, you know the difference between when I get everything that we need versus when I don't get everything that we need? It's when, I ha when we have a plan, when we have a, a menu. Every, like, adult in the room is just like, it's the worst, isn't it? But we list out, hey, on Monday we're going to have this, and we need these groceries to produce that. Tuesday we're going to do this, and we need these groceries to produce that. And you go down Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, and I always try to write in, like, go out for barbecue, and Becky's, like, crossing it out. It never works out. But when I have a plan, it works out for us. It's like when something is broken at our house, and Becky's like, hey, this is broken, are we going to fix it? And I go, yeah, I got it. There are seasons where she trusts that. But you know what makes it easier for her to trust that answer? Is when I have a plan. And I show her, hey, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to call my buddy Quinn, or I'm going to call my buddy Jason, and they're going to come over, and they're going to help me fix this thing. Jason, Quinn, get ready for a phone call later this week. I'm just kidding. <laughs> They're like, what? And at the sake of you wondering if God really has answers to your question, 
at the sake of you wondering if God really has a plan for your life, just like I make a list when I go grocery shopping, God's got a list for you this morning. I'm going to start reading it. The worship team's going to come up. And, and I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to read this rapid fire. It's going to be too fast for you to write them all down. It's not going to be on the screen anywhere. But if you want a copy of this list, you have to email me for it. I don't have a printed copy of it in the back for you. I'm going to put it on you. If you want this list about what God says about you, you have to email me for it. It goes something like this. That you are a child of the living God. That you are redeemed from the hand of the enemy. That you are forgiven and you are saved by grace through faith. You are justified, you are sanctified, and you are a new creature, and you are a partaker of the divine nature. You have been redeemed from the curse of the law. You have been delivered from the powers of darkness, and you are being led by the Spirit of God that lives inside you. You are a son or daughter of the living God. You are kept safely wherever you go, and you are getting all of your needs met in Jesus Christ. You have the ability to cast all of your cares upon him, you are strong in the power of his might. You are doing all things through Christ who strengthens you. You are an heir of God and a co-heir with Jesus Christ. You are also an heir to the blessing of Abraham. You have within you the ability to do all and observe everything that the Lord has commanded. You are blessed, blessed, blessed. You are an heir of eternal life. You are blessed with every spiritual blessing. You are sealed by his stripes. You have the power to exercise authority over the enemy. You are above only and never beneath. You are more than a conqueror. You are establishing God's word here on earth. You are overcoming by the blood of the lamb and the power of his testimony. Daily, you are subduing and overcoming the devil. You have the power to not be moved by what you see. You have the power to walk by faith and not by sight. You cast down vain imaginations and you bring every thought into captivity and you are being renewed and you are being transformed by the renewing of your mind you are a co-laborer with god you are the righteousness of god in christ you can be an imitator of jesus you are the light of the world and you have within you the ability to bless and praise god at all times by how you choose to live your life. In the midst of your doubts and uncertainty, God has answers and he has a plan and he has a list for you. Because we serve a God that is above all, beyond all, the one who is, who was, and who will be. And it's right there for you. You have to step into it. I would invite you stand if you want. You can sit and sing it however you want to do this. I don't care. But join the team as they sing praises.